Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's program, Here to There, the History and Future of Chicago's Transportation. We're really excited to welcome you to tonight's program, which is put on in partnership with a few different organizations. First, we'd like to thank Chicago for Chicagoans, which is an all-volunteer nonprofit organization dedicated to educating Chicagoans about the history of their own city. They collaborate with passionate residents to offer pay-what-you-can walking tours and lecture events featuring Chicago neighborhoods, hyper-local community history, and the rich stories behind the city streets we walk every day. We encourage you to donate to their web to visit their website and donate to help keep them running. We'd also like to thank the University of Illinois at Chicago School of Civil Materials and Environmental Engineering. The UIC CME is made up of dedicated faculty who are who serve the needs of their students, the field, and of society. CME faculty is passionate about serving the community and building a better world through their work and research. We're very lucky to be partnering with both of them to put on this event. And if you're new to our programming, C2ST is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the public's awareness of science and technology topics and their impacts on society. If you like our programming, we encourage you to visit our website and to donate. You can also visit c2st.cnf.io to ask questions of our speakers today. We have four of them, and if you want to learn a little bit more about them, you can see that information there as well. So this program is the history in the future. I'm going to start by introducing our history speakers for today, and then we'll hear a little bit from them, and then we'll introduce the future speakers later. Um, so first we have Erica Ruggiero, who's a principal and lead historic preservation specialist at the women-owned architecture firm McGuire, Igleski and Associates Incorporated. Erica is part of numerous historical organizations that help her hone her understanding of Chicago's history and history beyond. We also have Ava Francesca Batocchio, who is a doctoral student and university enrichment fellow in the Department of Advertising and Public Relations at Michigan State University. Ava Francesca is particularly interested in post-industrial, rural, and remote communities with an emphasis on socio-spatial and cultural historical perspectives. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your expertise. Erica, I think we have you up first. Do you wanna kick us off? Sure, thank you so much, Alex. Um, and thank you to everyone who I cannot see but is joining us tonight. Um, I'm gonna start us off with a, a brief history on transportation in Chicago. So just imagine yourself, we're gonna start at uh, where Lake Michigan meets the Chicago River uh, in today's loop. So the history of Chicago becoming an epicenter of local, national, and global transportation begins with the city's unique confluence of natural and man-made geography, history, and industry. Chicago grew from a small village established in 1833 to a city of 1.7 million residents by 1900, a rate of growth that astonished period observers. Two significant factors in that growth, especially in terms of the city's position as an industrial and commercial giant, were geography and transportation. Although originally swampy and unprepossessing in appearance, Chicago's location on the southwestern edge of Lake Michigan was exceptional in terms of transportation potential. In 1829, the Illinois legislator appointed commissioners to locate a canal and lay out the surrounding town to be known as Chicago, which at that time had a population of less than 100 people. On July 12, 1834, the Illinois from New York was the first commercial schooner to enter the harbor and sail up the Chicago River. Chicago's first wave of transportation had begun. The waterways of the Great Lakes, rivers, and canals are the catalyst to Chicago's transportation history. Before the widespread construction of railroads in the mid 19th century, water transportation was the cheapest, fastest, and most reliable means of transportation available in the United States. It began with the Chicago Portage, a small watershed which separates the Chicago River. It flows from the Great Lakes and eventually to the North Atlantic. Uh, and the Portage separates it from the Des Plaines River, which is part of the extensive Mississippi River system. One of the first Europeans to explore the region, Robert de La Salle, noted that digging a small canal would link these two massive waterways, and in 1836, construction was started on the Illinois-Michigan Canal. The city was formally incorporated one year later on March 4, 1837. Two decades before opening the I&M Canal, on July 4, 1828, 
the first public railroad in the United States, known as the Baltimore and Ohio, had its first run. At first, early railroads radiated out of the eastern cities. Illinois established its first railroad in 1842, an east to west alignment known as the Northern Cross Railroad. It opened at 55 miles in length between the capital of Springfield and Meridogia, Illinois, which is located directly west of Springfield on the Illinois River. Six years later, in 1848, the first railroad arrived in Chicago and began operation, running the very short distance between Chicago and Oak Park. This first railroad was the Galena and Chicago Union Railroad, meant to connect the lead mines of Galena with Chicago and beyond. Railroad construction was set back by the financial panic of 1837 and the state's overspending on grandiose internal improvement projects. Personally, I would love for someone to compare what grandiose infrastructure plans of the late 1830s are compared to today. So if anyone's looking for a thesis topic, maybe that's one. After securing the necessary funding and land rights, the first tracks were laid in the fall of 1848. On November 20th of that year, a group of merchants traveled the very long eight miles of track to what is now Oak Park. On the way back to the city, two of the passengers spotted a farmer driving a load of wheat and hides behind a pair of oxen. They stopped, they bought the wheat and hides, and they hauled in Chicago's first load of railroad freight. For the first time after the opening of the Galena and Chicago Union Railroad, Chicago had road, rail, and water transportation routes, and later air connections. These all would establish Chicago as the transportation hub of the nation. At the same time, Chicago had become home to national retailers offering catalog shopping such as Montgomery Ward and Sears Roebuck, Roebuck and Company, which in turn used the transportation lines to ship all over the nation. By 1856, 10 main lines with approximately 3,000 miles of track were in the city. The main lines from the east and in Chicago and those which began in the west uh, or ended in the west began in Chicago. Factories, warehouses, lumber yards, and stockyards all clustered in and near Chicago during the second half of the 19th century, making the city a manufacturing wholesale center for the nation. Chicago became a processing center for natural resource commodities extracted in the West. Timber shipped by rail supported the millwork and lumber business. The Illinois hinterland provided the wheat and hundreds of thousands of lots by rail uh, for preparation and, and ultimately uh, sale into national markets. The history of Chicago transportation was dictated by its natural setting. The iron and timber for rail ties and tracks were shipped across the lakes from the mines and forests of Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. The coal to power the steam engines was mined in southern Illinois and shipped through the new canal systems. Chicago became the capital of the Midwest because its geography had supplied the ingredients to create this industrial system of transportation. For the next hundred years, railroads brought the grain of the prairie the timber of the North Country, the meat of the West, and the people of the world into Chicago. By the turn of the 20th century, there were about 60 rail lines running through the city that carried freight and passengers to and from the city every day. This evolution to offer passenger and commuter service along Chicago's established railroads is the advent of public, public rapid rail transit in the city. Public passenger transportation has its beginnings in Chicago as early as 1859, 11 years after the opening of our city's first railroad. For the first eight decades, the city's public transportation routes were operated by private industrialists who were granted franchises to operate Chicago streetcars, bus, and rapid transit systems. A franchise is an authorization granted by a government or company to an individual or group enabling them to carry out a specific commercial activity for a certain amount of years, ranging from 25, 50, or even 100 years. Before going to city council for franchise approval, companies had to solicit frontage consent signatures from a majority of property owners. This would later play an impact in how our, um, our elevated system is operated and, and where it's located today. 
Public transportation franchises approved by the city council had various requirements unique to each franchise, including location of station houses, fares, color of station houses, or a deadline for when the transportation line had to be built by. These first franchises were held by extensive stagecoach and omnibus lines, which would eventually become our modern bus system, though extensively pared down as it evolved through the eras of streetcars, cable cars, and electric trolleys. For already existing companies such as the railroads, it was easy to add passenger service and boost their profits to their already existing lines without forming a new company or franchise. As previously noted, there were about 60 lines in Chicago, many of which had freight and passenger service. So these are just some of the highlights of uh, major rail lines still in use today that you may be familiar with. Uh, the first is the Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul Railroad commonly known as the Milwaukee Road. At its peak, it stretched from Louisville to Puget Sound, and today is still used by Amtrak's Empire Builder, which runs between Chicago uh, and Portland and Seattle, depending on the branch you take. I've personally taken this line, and I can definitely vouch that sitting on a train for 36 hours uh, is not as bad as one would think. It's actually pretty cool. Um, and then there's also the Amtrak's Hiawatha line, which initially ran between Chicago and the Twin Cities, but due to a decline in ridership, will still take you on a day trip to our beautiful neighboring city of Milwaukee. And if you've ever traveled via Metra to Fox Lake, Antioch, or Elgin, you may have gotten on this line at the historic Western Avenue station. Or if you prefer to head south a little bit to Springfield or St. Louis, You've probably taken Amtrak's Lincoln service, which follows the line first established by the Alton Railroad. And if you elect for a more scenic route to the Western suburbs like River Forest or St. Charles, you'll ride Metro's U Union Pacific West Line and will have rode Chicago's oldest rail route, first established by the Glena and Chicago Union in 1848. The multi-purpose use of these rail lines did not stop with suburban and national travel, but looked inward to provide intercity travel via rapid transit, which today is the city's elevated system. In Chicago, the idea of an elevated rail line began as early as 1869, a decade after the city's first horse-powered street railway opened, and two years after the idea originated in, Ch in New York City. Chicago, always unfortunately the second city. As the population rapidly grew outward from the city core, it became apparent that a form of mass transit would be needed to travel the distance between new residential areas and the commercial industrial areas of downtown. The elevated lines and the development of the city had a symbiotic relationship. Between 1872 and 1900, over 70 private elevated railroad companies incorporated in Chicago, but only four companies managed to operate rapid transit trains for passenger services. This included the Chicago and Southside Rapid Transit Railroad, also known as the Alley L. Uh, today, that is the green, the green Line to Cottage Grove. Then there's the Lake Street Elevated Railroad, which is today's Green Line to Oak Park. The third company is the Metropolitan West Side Elevated Railroad, uh, which today encompasses uh, the Blue Line and the Pink Line. And then lastly, there's the Northwestern Elevated Railroad, which encompasses our red, brown, purple, and yellow lines. Elevated lines went where development was beginning, and once the lines were established, higher density development followed. By the end of the first decade of operation in the 1890s, the elevated lines had reached the community areas of Lakeview, Uptown, Garfield Park, Douglas Park, Logan Square, Humboldt Park, Hyde Park, Bronzeville, Oak Park, and Austin. Many of these neighborhoods were already established and the L was reactionary. The owners of the elevated lines hoped that transportation improvements to the city would make it easier to reach major points of interest such as downtown or the World's Columbian Exposition in 1893, or even home in one of the newly annexed residential areas. The elevated lines did not cause the settlement of new areas of the city or create a new development pattern. Instead, through transportation improvements, the elevated contributed to the development of the city by making it easier 
for the city to progress with the industrial and technological revolution occurring at the turn of the 20th century. To streamline the response of the elevated lines to development booms across the city, one line looked to expedite the creation of a northern elevated line. This was the Northwestern Elevated Railroad. The last leg of the elevated structure to be built for the growing transit using public was that of today's red line. The company was incorporated in 1893, but didn't begin full service until 1900 due to an array of financial and legal problems caused by the depression of the mid 1890s. When opened in 1900, the Northwestern L connected to the loop at Wells and Lake, and then wound northward to a terminal at Wilson Avenue, still uh, prevalent or ex extent today. The route went through a number of growing communities with many potential L passengers. In 1903, a franchise was granted to build an extension into the newly developing Ravenswood neighborhood. Open for service in 1907, the branch, which wound northwest from about Clark Street to a terminal at Lawrence and Kimball, is now today's Brown Line. The Northwestern was then extended further north, beyond the city's ultimate limits at Howard Street, into the northern suburbs, suburbs for the first time. To expedite construction the Wilson to, of the Wilson to Howard extension, trackage rights were secured with the aforementioned Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul Railway, whose tracks met the L's at Wilson Avenue. These lines are still in service today as the current uh, concrete embankment that some of you may be familiar with that runs through the communities of Uptown Edgewater and Rogers Park, though they will soon be replaced as part of the CTA's red purple modernization program uh, nearly 125 years later. Service was so overwhelming that the Central Street terminal and yards were insufficient to handle the load. The line was then extended even further north along the tracks of the interurban line, the Chicago, North Shore, and Milwaukee Railroad to a new terminal at Linden Avenue, even further north to the suburb of Wilmette. By the early 20th century, the city of Chicago enjoyed one of the best rapid transit systems in the world. Today, uh, the Northwestern Elevated Railroad are the lines we still use for the red, purple, brown, and yellow lines of the CTA. From here, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Ava Francesca, to continue our discussion on historic rail-oriented public transit with a specific focus on its use during our nation's last pandemic. Hi, Erica. Thank you so much for turning it over to me and thanks for everyone else who's tuning in. Um, so I'm really glad that Erica kind of laid some of the foundation. So I'm gonna pick back up um, and talk a little bit about the Northwestern uh, Elevated Railroad and kind of, um, also talk about the development of the loop as well. Um, so as Erica previously mentioned, the Northwestern Elevated Railroad was incorporated in 1893, and it was the last privately constructed rapid transit line in Chicago, even though the city was um, experiencing a lot of growth in that area. And while this was also uh, it due in part to the financial panic, it was also due in part to transit mogul uh, Charles Tyson Yerkes. Uh, and Yerkes would go on to be crucial in the electrification and expansion of London Underground system, uh, but he was also known for his shady antics and his contribution to metropolitan transportation systems on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, before getting into elevated lines, Yerkes would first take control of Chicago's primary horse car streetcar operator, the Sh North Chicago Street Railway Company in 1886. Uh, and he would do this with his friends, uh, Philly Transit Kings, Peter Widener and William C. Elkins um, by taking advantage of low stock prices. Ultimately, they would set up a holding company and the North Chicago Street Railroad leases um, would lease all of its property to the holding company for 999 years. Um, this would basically become York's signature move. He would set up a complicated holding company and we, we would borrow from one to fund the next project. But despite this, uh, York ends up making a lot of really notable improvements to the system. He replaces horse cars with cable traction. He electrifies parts of the system. Um, and he fundamentally is behind the uh, Union Loop, which has become one of the sorts of cultural icons uh, within our city's history. Uh, so beginning in 1894, the Union Elevated Railroad Company aimed to create rapid transit access to city, the city's downtown. Uh, this was because up until this point, rapid transit could help 
travelers get to the periphery of Chicago Central Business District, but not actually into downtown. The loop wouldn't open until 1897, um, and this is partially because it was wrapped up in legislative and litigation issues, but these were pretty typical for Yerks who tried to exert monopolistic control through boodling or bribing, bribing um, which ends up creating a lot of political tension. Um, Chicago's traction war is way more comprehensive than we can even touch on uh, in the 10 minutes that I'm afforded, um, but Chicago for Chicagoans is a lecture on it if you're looking for more information. Anyway, one of the difficulties was that Yerkes uh, aimed to ultimately connect three competing uh, elevated rail lines. The South Side Elevated, which Erica touched on, um, and it's the oldest part of the L, is the first elevated rapid transit line in the city. Um, and with the construction of the South Side Elevated, in order to connect it to the loop, this it had to convert from rolling stock to third rail electrification and this also resulted in um, what is my understanding the first use of multiple unit train control which is still used to this day the second rapid transit line um, was the lake street elevated railroad this opened in 1893 even though it was chartered at the same time as the south side elevated um, and the lake street elevated would be sold by york sold to yorks Yerkes has got his, he's all wrapped up in this business, always. Anyway, the Lake Street Elevated was sold to Yerkes by Michael King Mike McDonald because apparently there's lots of kings in Chicago transit. But anyway, King Mike uh, financed the railroad in part with funds from his gambling advice fortune because um, he also had a similar habit to Yerkes in terms of keeping politicians and aldermen in his back pocket while flipping railroad lines to turn a profit. The third was the Metropolitan West Side Elevated Railroad. Um, and this was the first line to use electric traction and to connect both the Northwest and Southwest sides of the city. And then lastly, um, the Northwestern Elevated Rail Service would come online in 1900 to connect to the loop after the sort of usual hodgepodge of legal and financial issues that seemed to go wherever Yerkes went. Um, initially, the connection from Wilson to the Loop was supposed to be completed on New Year's Eve, 1899, but by the time that that deadline came and went, uh, there there was only one track, um, and most of the st station construction hadn't even started yet, and the Chicago Public Works ultimately deemed the railroad unsafe on New Year's Day, 1900, but the Northwestern continued to run service anyway, even though the police tried to stop the train by arresting the motorman, and at one point, opening the Wells Street Bridge. Um, eventually a renewed franchise was renegotiated so work could continue and the line could ultimately open on May 31st, 1900. Uh, but within the next year, Yerkes would end up selling off his shares to Widener and Elkins um, and go off to London. Um, so due in part to this, this complicated situation that one could call corruption as well, there is a push for municipal ownership of both utilities and transportation infrastructure, not just in Chicago, but throughout the United States. Um, and transit and public utilities, specifically electricity, would become very married in Chicago, um, especially when we look at the Lake Street Elevated um, and their inability to fund construction of their powerhouse, which led to the entrance of Samuel Insull. Insel was the president of the Chicago Edison Company, which in turn ends up consolidating with Commonwealth Electric Light and Power to become Commonwealth Edison Company, if you can follow, um, and they begin selling power to the elevated lines. So while Insel is uh, strategizing to integrate utility and transit revenue, he ends up being the financial backer for a deal that would buy the outstanding shares of the South Side and Metropolitan, Northwestern and Lake Street Elevated, which at, in 1904 became the Chicago and Oak Park Elevated. Um, all four lines end up consolidating into the Chicago Elevated Railway Collateral Trust in 1913. And this would ultimately lead to platform revisions and through service, giving Chicagoans access to their first cross town service. Um, Insel would also go on to acquire the Chicago and Milwaukee Electric Railroad and revive it as the Chicago North Shore and Milwaukee Railroad in 1916. But by this time, Chicago reportedly has about 1,800 miles of paved streets, 900 miles of streetcar tracks, and about 150 miles of ele elevated railway trackage. But the city is also on the verge of the 1918 influenza epidemic, um, with the first cases um, occurring at the Great Lakes Naval Training Center in North Chicago in early September, and then coming to a head in our city um, around the end of September. 
So by early October, the city had closed most public lo locations where people were likely to hang out. And the health commissioner, uh, Dr. Robertson, orders a smoking ban on all elevated lines, streetcars, and interurban cars, which um, he apparently refers to as moving houses in a lot of the early um, newspaper articles. Um, and this was done to curb the spread of influenza, pneumonia, and bron bronchitis. At the time, three of the four elevated lines and at least the front platform of streetcars allowed smoking. However, most of the Chicago Daily Tribune coverage that I have found doesn't specify which lines allowed smoking and which ones didn't. Really curious about that. Additionally, transit companies were encouraged to keep the front doors of streetcars open to promote fresh airflow into cabins. And pretty similar to the CTA's handling of COVID, Robertson also called for daily sanitization of elevated and streetcars um, as mass transit was considered by public health officials to be a prime location for basically moving influenza around the city. Walking was also promoted as a means of commuting uh, to minimize transit overcrowding as working from home really wasn't an option in 1918. Um, and these practices were also rolled out with the city's anti-spitting laws and the recommendation that Chicagoans wear God's face coverings in public. Um, as you can imagine, uh, ridership decreased. And so beginning in 1921, um, we started to see the rise of advertising campaigns to promote transit infrastructure within the city of Chicago. And these campaigns ultimately continued in 1924 when the Chicago Elevated Railway Company ends up consolidating. Um, there's about 160 of these advertising posters. I'm sh you've probably seen them. They're often referred to as the insult posters. Um, they're really comprehensive and they're awesome and you should check them out. Um, anyway, we weren't, be we weren't able to protect rapid transit from decreased ridership during the Great Depression along with the rise of the automobile. So after several unsuccessful attempts to fund subway construction uh, to relieve system congestion, the city receives federal grant funding for, pu for public works um, in 1937 under President Roosevelt. And as a result, the Dearborn and State Street tunnels would break ground in 1938. Um, by 1947, um, the Chicago Surface Lines and Chicago Rapid Transit companies would transfer their assets to the Chicago Transit Authority, um, accomplishing the goal of transitioning away from private and franchise towards municipal ownership of transit infrastructure in Chicago. And with that, I am going to pass it off to our modern transportation experts. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much to Ava, Francesca, and Erica for giving us the glimpse into the history of Chicago's transportation. I know it's such a rich subject, and honestly, we could probably go on and on and on about it. Um, but hopefully, we'll be, get some good questions that you can help uh, further illuminate for us in the future. Um, so I'd like to now introduce our speakers who are going to touch on the future of transportation in Chicago and even beyond. Um, so we have Dr. Jane Lynn, who's a professor and the Department of Civil and Materials Engineering and holds a joint appointment with the Institute for Environmental Science and Policy at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Her research focuses on sustainable multimodal transportation systems and design with applications of data analytics and system analysis methods. We also have Dr. Bo Zhu, who is an associate professor in the Department of Civil and Materials Engineering at UIC again. Dr. Zhu's research has been in the area of transportation systems analysis with emerging technologies, including vehicle platooning, automation, ride sharing, and crowdsourcing. Thank you so much for joining us, Jane. Whenever you're ready, you can pop your, your PowerPoint on screen. Thank you, Alex, and thank you, Erica and uh, Eva Francesca for this rich uh, history. Uh, I learned quite a bit from that. It's always fun to learn about history. So I'm going to share my screen. So in, in universities these days, we live by a, a PowerPoint slide. So I'm going to share my screen. So uh, in the next, uh, can you see my screen? OK, good. All right, good. So in the next 10 minutes also, I'm going to uh, share my uh, work and some of my ideas about the future of transportation in Chicagoland. Um, so, but before I do that, I thought that it would be uh, really appropriate to uh, first look at what's happening in transportation now uh, before we look into the future. So um, this uh, um, plot shows um, the impact of COVID-19 on the statewide vehicle miles of travel, or VMT, uh, in the state of Illinois. So you can see that this actually shows the, the annual VMT uh, from 1950 all the way to last year, 2020. So, um, so we see this steady in, uh, increase in VMT. 
up until the turn of the century. And then the VMT started to uh, plateau uh, the last uh, you know, two decades or so. And then last year in 2020, because of the pandemic, we see this uh, big uh, drop, right? So in fact, uh, the, the, the reduction in 2020 was about uh, 11 to 12 percent from the previous years in the last decade. So, um, so if we uh, zoom into the data and look more closely at what's happening uh, last year due to the pandemic, so um, we first I want you to uh, pay attention to the the yellow line and the blue line. Okay, so the yellow line shows the total traffic, uh, the surface traffic in the state of Illinois. Okay. And so overall, you see the, the decline, especially uh, if you look at before the, uh, you know, towards the, you know, in the, the, the basically uh, the whole time. So this is right before the pandemic, the lockdown in early March. And then this is up until uh, early January 2021. So you see that the yellow line shows the overall traffic has gone down. And the blue line shows the passenger vehicle traffic that has also gone down and the two lines follow closely in terms of the, the pattern, right? Uh, but now um, I want, want you to shift your focus to the other two lines, the uh, orange line and the, this gray line. So this two, the orange line shows the single unit truck traffic in the state of Illinois. And um, the gray line shows the combination truck traffic in the state of Illinois. So you see that, um, you know, if you ignore the, 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 this final part a little bit, so in most of uh, 2020, so you see that the single uh, unit truck traffic has gone up actually quite significantly, so as high as, you know, 15% at some point. Um, and similarly, you can see that the combination truck traffic also has gone up, although to a much uh, lesser uh, degree compared to the single unit trucks. So. And and uh, and then later on, uh, you know, in late uh, November, December, and January time frame, so we see some drop. I think this is probably due to the weather and also the holiday um, break, right? So typically we see a surge in the holiday break, but not not during the pandemic. So um, so why why do I show you uh, why do I show you this thing? So why do I want to uh, focus your attention to these uh, differences between the passenger vehicle traffic and the truck traffic? So the reason for that is um, the implications to uh, energy consumptions and, and vehicle emissions, right? So even though the total uh, light duty vehicles, so that's mostly the passenger vehicles, they are powered by uh, gasoline. So it's many, many times, 7.5 times higher than the heavy duty vehicle uh, VMT. So that's the 20 year average. But if you look at the per mile, emissions from the heavy duty vehicles, these are mostly uh, diesel powered vehicles and larger vehicles. So the, if you look at the per mile emissions, for example, for the uh, nitrogen oxides and hydrogen, uh, uh, the um, hydrocarbons and also the uh, particular matter 2.5 means these are very small particles. So the, uh, the diameter is uh, no greater than the 2.5 micrometers. So if you look at all this, you know, they are many, many times higher than uh, the gasoline vehicles. And I will come back to this point later on to see what, what are the implications to the, uh, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions, the total energy consumptions. And if you look at the CO2 emissions, roughly speaking, for the uh, heavy duty vehicles, they are 15% higher than the uh, gasoline light duty vehicles. Okay. And then, um, uh, on the other hand, we, we already know that, you know, the transit ridership, uh, as uh, Eva Francesca also alluded to. So um, the, we, we have seen this huge, huge decrease in ridership. So this plot shows uh, at the beginning of March 2020 uh, all the way to uh, February 2021. So, so this is a quite recent. Uh, so actually March 1st, 2021. So we still see huge reduction in terms of ridership. Uh, both uh, the CTA rail, the CTA bus, uh, metro, train, and the pace bus. So we have a long way to uh, climb ourselves out of the, this uh, uh, huge ridership reduction. And, uh, and uh, there's some good news. So during the pandemic, we know that a lot, of, a lot more people are riding bikes or using the active modes of transportation. 
So this plot actually shows in major cities in the in the U.S. So they all see this surge in uh, bicycling, right? So Chicago is actually this line here. So we all see this uh, this uh, surge in uh, bicycling. And this uh, on the right side, this is actually an article from the Street Block Chicago, uh, published on September 21st, 2020. And it shows the by actually saw this huge uh, record uh, ridership, uh, 600K uh, trips in uh, August. So this is good news. But overall, what do all these things mean to the total transportation greenhouse gas emissions or the uh, carbon dioxide emissions? So this is actually um, uh, the, uh, this plot actually comes from the data from the U.S. Energy Information Administration, which is part of the U.S. Department of Energy. So it shows uh, the total carbon dioxide emission uh, in the transportation sector from January 2019 all the way to January uh, 2021. So basically the two year time frame. So uh, the whole 2019 and the whole 2020. So you do see that, uh, you know, obviously we experienced a, a dip in, you know, during the lockdown, at, especially at the beginning of it. But I wanted to actually point out a few uh, observations here. So you see that actually the total uh, transportation CO2 emissions has consistently declined since um, August to 2019. So you see that this this is the trend that is showing it's actually declining even before the pandemic. So the pandemic actually happens around this time uh, in 2020. And then if we look at um, during the pandemic, so this is right before the pandemic, uh, February 2020, and this is July 2020. So we're still in the midst of the pandemic. So the total transportation CO2 emissions in 20 July 2020 actually has exceeded the, the total amount before the pandemic in February 2020. Surprising, surprising. And even after the aviation CO2 emissions took a 37% reduction during this time frame. So between uh, February and July 2020. So that's that's a very uh, surprising finding. But nonetheless, you know, that's, uh, that's a, a very interesting uh, statistic. And also, if you look at since the since July 2020, uh, total transportation CO2, uh, the CO2 emissions is pretty much back to the level before the pandemic, so around the February time frame. So if you see that this, although there's a little bit of the dip uh, at the beginning of uh, 2021, as mentioned, probably due to the the holiday break and, and so on. Um. So, but more or less, it's back to the level before the pandemic. Okay, uh, in February. So especially if you look at uh, from the surface freight transportation, the total CO2 emissions, uh, this is actually uh, in 20, 2019 and after this line is 2020. So what you see is that the pandemic really ha has, has not put a dent on the uh, CO2 emissions from the surface freight transportation uh, nationwide. And on the other hand, the uh, total CO2 emissions follow very closely the pattern from the surface passenger transportation, as we can imagine, because most of the surface traffic is made of uh, passenger transportation, right? So, um, what is, so, so basically, to summarize what I what I have said at, uh, so far, so so we see this uh, shift in traffic composition. Overall, the surface traffic is down due to the, uh, largely people working from home during the pandemic. And, and this is likely to, to continue uh, as, as uh, you know, the, uh, after the pandemic, as people probably uh, have more flexibility to choose working from home. Uh, and on the other hand, the, tra the truck traffic is up, largely due to the increased uh, e-commerce activities, online shopping, and so on. And so, and so what that means is more this large, medium-sized vehicles uh, now uh, make up the traffic, uh, traffic uh, flow. Um, and we know that, as I show you, that you know this this type of vehicles they typically consume uh, more energy. They are higher emitters, and they travel longer distance, and also have greater technological barriers in electrification and other and adopting other alternative uh, 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 in transportation. Right. 
So, uh, and what this means is the impact on transportation, uh, impact of COVID-19 on transportation, energy consumption, and greenhouse gas emissions is not uh, one directional, right? So on one hand, we, we see passenger, uh, passenger vehicle traffic contributes less, uh, due to the re reduction in traffic, but um, the heavy duty vehicles actually contributed uh, much higher. So that's that's the uh, emerging trend. So what do all this mean to um, okay, so what do all this mean to the uh, future transportation? okay so um, so I'm going to quickly go over some of the ideas. So we have seen all these things. You can probably recognize some of these things in the recent trends and innovations in, in uh, mobility. Um, but I will just quickly go through this public transit service. So uh, in the interest of time, I know that I won't be able to talk about the first and last mile logistics. Hopefully, we will touch upon that. And so I think uh, in order to, to survive the, uh, the uh, uh, reduction in transit, so we really need a, a drastic change and paradigm shift to not only survive, but win back and even increase the ridership. And I think the current transit system is inflexible in terms of vehicle cap capacity and also in, in terms of the, uh, the de demand responsive responsiveness, right? So, um, and so uh, one solution um, is to have this hybrid conventional and micro transit or modular services. So we, we still need the conventional transit vehicles to, you know, this is an easy solution to, to uh, uh, respond to the surge demand during the rush hours. But on the other hand, we also need this kind of more flexible micro transit. And even into the future, this uh, autonomous modular vehicle technology to uh, be more. Uh, you know, demand responsive during the you know the non rush hour service. So I'm going to actually end my my talk by just showing you a video of 40 second video um, to show you what this uh, autonomous modular vehicle technology is about. So this is a much smaller vehicles. It's about six seat uh, vehicle modular vehicle, but they can be connected in real time perform a larger train. So, you, so that means the capacity is uh, you know, very flexible and you can you know, customize the, uh, the capacity based on the demand. And people can actually change the, the, the cars as they go along. So to facilitate this in route transfer, and then they can form the train as they go and also can break off as they go. All right, so I think that's uh, basically, I'm gonna end here, thank you. Bo, I think we're gonna turn it over to you whenever you're ready. So uh, thanks, uh, Alex, and thanks, Jane. And uh, I'm going to uh, kind of continue, uh, let me see, where is my... Okay, so I'm going to continue uh, sort of uh, on uh, what Jane just talked about, the emerging technologies of uh, uh, and its impact on transportation future. Uh, my talk is focused on the shared autonomous mobility uh, in, in general. So uh, I would like to start the, uh, my talk uh, with a two, uh, one picture and one kind of animation. Uh, the picture is uh, people's, uh, reflects people's imagination of autonomous vehicles back in the 1950s or 1960s, when uh, that's what kids were told about the future of travel. On the right hand side, it's uh, for those of you who are old enough, that's uh, the, the Jetsons uh, flying cars. Uh, seems uh, at that time people already thinking about the airspace being quite busy uh, with uh, lots of uh, cars that can fly in the air. So uh, on the with technology developments, uh, the, these trends or this imagination of uh, using uh, autonomous and even flying vehicles are really now becoming a reality or not far away from be becoming reality. Uh, today, uh, autonomous vehicles have been a very hot topic. Uh, here I just present two figures showing the projection of autonomous vehicle sales uh, 
fleet and the travel projections. On the left-hand side, we can see the projection from uh, 2020 all the way to 2070. Uh, depending on you are optimistic or pessimistic, you have different projections. But overall, by 2070, you will see the uh, autonomous vehicles will dominate uh, the transportation system uh, by then. On the right-hand side, we can see a projection of uh, the percentage of uh, passenger miles by privately owned vehicles versus by ride sharing. And this projection was done uh, before the pandemic 2017. And of course, uh, this may not may, may need to be adapted given the still ongoing uh, pandemic situation. But the overall trend is that as time goes by, uh, ride sharing or share use mobility will become a more popular and eventually dominant way of travel. So on the, on the ground, when we talk about shared autonomous mobility, we need to understand a few critical questions. The first one is uh, with the shared autonomous vehicles, will there be fewer vehicles on the road? The answer is uh, probably yes, given that a shared autonomous vehicle may have multiple riders as compared to solo driving. There has been uh, quite a bit of research that has been done showing that an autonomous vehicle can replace between six to 10 human driven vehicles. So that's a significant uh, high ratio of replacements and significant reduction number of vehicles. But that does not mean that the vehicle miles traveled will be fewer. This is because a shared autonomous vehicle will be constantly used either in accommodating riders or just in picking up riders or relocating to a place where the vehicle believes there's going to be a high demand. But it can also be parked when not in use. So there is a kind of a balance between having a lot of empty vehicle miles or parking those cars while uh, they're not in use. But of course, when we have lots of uh, uh, vehicles idle available, then that will uh, make the service more responsive to a rider's request. From a bigger picture perspective, there is uh, the nexus between the demand, supply, and the infrastructure. Um, so uh, on the demand side, we have market shares of uh, different types of vehicles, including share autonomous vehicles. The supply, we need to understand what is what will be the pricing level, what's the size of the, the shared autonomous vehicle fleets, where the operations. On the infrastructure side, we need to decide whether we need more capacity on the roads, less capacity. How about the parking facilities and the vehicle to vehicle and the vehicle to infrastructure uh, communication capabilities? Third, we need to understand even with the presence of the shared autonomous mobility, will people use shared autonomous vehicles instead of driving? The answer is it depends. Vehicles uh, depends on lots of factors such as vehicle fuel economy, the waiting time, the trip time by taking autonomous vehicles, and the, the price of the service, privacy, and even carbon tax in the, uh, with the uh, mounting pressure of climate change. And lastly, we need to understand, will we have this shared autonomous service uh, owned and operated by a private company like Uber or Lyft, or we want to run it as a future version of transit? Private operators only seek profit maximization, and they may ignore negative social impacts such as empty vehicles wandering on the streets could lead to greater traffic congestion. So in order to mitigate the negative social impact, policy interventions, economic incentives, and regulations need to be in place. As I said, there have been quite a bit of studies doing uh, research in this area. Uh, I just want to share with you some of uh, our uh, simulation work that that's uh, that's looked at the shared autonomous mobility and its impact on the system. So I want to highlight a few things. First, we look at the number of hours that the share, shared autonomous vehicles spend in different states, whether in service, in other words, having passengers on board, or in pickup, or in relocation. You can see that actually lots of time of the shared autonomous vehicle hours will be uh, empty or having no riders in a vehicle. 50% of the time will be in pickup and 8% eight, eight, eight of the time will be in relocation. In terms of the market share, we see that 
uh, despite the presence of autonomous vehicles, there will still be uh, a lot of travelers choosing human-driven vehicles. They prefer choosing uh, driving themselves, maybe because of the high cost of choosing shared autonomous mobility, or maybe because of a perception of safety and privacy. And uh, we estimated that one shared autonomous vehicle can replace 6.2 uh, human-driven vehicles. And with ride sharing, the total vehicle miles traveled or VMT will be reduced by about 18% in the system. Now let's uh, uh, switch gear now uh, to look at what's, what will happen in the air. Uh, actually, the, the concept of urban air mobility is not new. Uh, about five years ago, Uber already published a working uh, a white paper on the future of urban air mobility. Uh, the figure on the left, uh, lower left, is a uh, prototype aircraft uh, called uh, uh, Vertical Takeoff and Landing VTOL aircraft by uh, Joby Aviation, which now has acquired the uh, Uber, Uber's branch for urban uh, air mobility. I have also searched a little bit uh, on the website about the, the illustration or imagination of urban air mobility in, in Chicago. So here are two pictures. You can see uh, the first one on the top is a kind of a sitting in a, in a um, uh, urban air mobility aircraft uh, flying over Lincoln Park towards downtown. And uh, the lower right shows uh, multiple different types of uh, aircraft flying just in the downtown area. Urban air mobility is an emerging concept where passenger carrying air taxis and package delivery drones operate over populated areas and aircraft being developed uh, uh, highly automated, electric and vertically take off and landing e -vetos. And it's expected to be attractive, safe and environmentally responsible. And here is an estimate that uh, uh, if you want to travel in the San Francisco Bay Area from downtown San Francisco to San Jose, the, uh, if you take a Uber, it will take you one hour and 40 minutes, while if you take this urban air mobility, it takes you only 15 minutes. It's uh, one application under the broad concept of uh, advanced or urban area mobility, or AAM. So I'm not going to uh, uh, read all these items, but you can see it covers a broad range of potential uses and involves a number of different stakeholders. The market potential for UAM uh, can be can be large, but of course it's subject to uh, uh, lots of uncertainties. Under the most constrained scenario, uh, there will be 55,000 daily trips in the nation, about 0.1% of the total daily work trips in the country, with an annual market value of $2.5 billion. But if under the most optimal scenario, about 20% of the all daily work trips can be uh, using the urban air mobility with a market value of $500 billion. There are some challenges to overcome. For example, there, ne there needs to be a collaboration among different stakeholders in transportation, computer science, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, planning policy, and between public and private sectors. Social acceptance is uh, crucial. Will people care about ride sharing in an aircraft without pilots? with only strangers? How about the noise and visual annoyance for uh, different neighborhoods? The perception about privacy and a sense of trust? The regulation in terms of new aircraft type certification and integration of the new aircraft into the existing airspace? And finally, the economy, uh, that is the final decisive factor. The viability is critical for scaling up the urban air mobility operation the current service price estimate seems to be high, uh, but the higher price may be accepted given the travel time savings. As technology matures, the price is, is expected to reduce in the future. So a final note, the future of urban transportation will be shared and automated and hopefully also electri uh, electrified. And travel space will extend from 2D to 3D covering both ground and air. Despite uncertainties and challenges through sharing, electrification, and more efficient operations, shared autonomous mobility presents significant promise to enhance convenience, efficiency, and potentially sustainability of future transportation. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much to our speakers today. We really appreciate you um, sharing your expertise with us. What a wealth of information on such a variety of different topics. I think probably each one of you could have had your own presentation today. Um, so I don't think, unfortunately, we have time for questions now, but hopefully we can put together a blog post in response to this program that will allow us to answer some of those questions that you had. Um, yeah, but to close it today, I'd like to introduce uh, Patty Swanson from Chicago for Chicago, and she's going to be doing our sign off today. Patty, whenever you're ready. All right. Well, thank you so much to everyone who attended. I really appreciate it. And of course, thank you to the Chicago Council on Science and Technology for having us. Um, we, again, are a little 501c3 nonprofit organization called Chicago for Chicagoans. We offer pay what you can walking tours and history events and lectures like this with really cool partners um, like this one. Um, so please check us out. Please donate to the Chicago Council on Science and Technology if you can. Donate to our organization as well, chicagoforchicagoans.org. Um, we really appreciate your support. We love putting together presentations like this. Um, and I do believe Alex is going to be dropping a link into the comments for you guys to evaluate this program. So if you really liked it, um, please feel free to, uh, check, you know, leave us some nice, nice comments <laughs> in the uh, review. We would certainly appreciate it. Um, I think that's all I can think of. But again, thank you for having us. Thank you to all these speakers. This is truly amazing. Uh, and I can't wait for the next one. <laughs>